and talk about Kyrie Irving's game winner. Now, the reason why the title on the, the bottom of the segment is the way it is is because of the type of shot that Kyrie took. And it reminded me of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So I thought it would be a nice, funny play on words. Kyrie Abdul-Jabbar. Because the man literally walked down, the, walked into a left-handed skyhook from the free throw line. Like, he picked up, like, one dribble, one, two, and then skyhook with the offhand in front of Jokic's face for the game. Luka couldn't believe it. Kyrie couldn't believe it. Nobody on the internet could believe it because that is just a ridiculous shot, and that is probably, like, the only player that you think could make a shot like that with his offhand is Kyrie. Because Kyrie is such an elite finisher around the rim, and, like, he's one of the best layup makers I've ever seen. Like, because he's so ambidextrous when he goes up with the layup. Like, he could quickly switch hands however he wants. And not only that, that shot over Jokic, that is a really, really difficult shot. And one important like one thing that i think that should be important in this game was how how that game winning shot ended up coming out so the nuggets they had the ball jamal murray had the ball and he shot a 3 then the mavs came down on the other end and luka hit a 3 making the game tied then jamal murray comes down the court again and he misses a jumper now there's 5 seconds left on the clock i don't know personally i don't know why he didn't wait a little bit longer to take that shot because leaving five seconds left in the game I know it doesn't sound like a lot but it is a lot of time especially when the other team has the timeout because out of the timeout they could come they could drop a play that only takes five seconds to do and anything can happen in those five seconds like how we've seen in this uh in this game right over here and it's really really like it's, I think it's concerning simply because of their game management and their time management. Like, I totally get how Jamal Murray, he was probably in rhythm and he, was, he felt extremely confident in that shot. But regardless, like, you cannot give Kyrie Irving or Luka Doncic the ball in the final minutes, in the final seconds and rely on your defense to win the game. I'm I'm sorry, but you just simply cannot do that because Kyrie and Luka Doncic, they're known for hitting um I'm just pulling up the box scores right here, don't mind me. They are known for hitting some of the most clutch shots that you'll ever see. So, you as a player, you cannot give them the ball back. You really cannot leave you can't give them the ball back if you have enough time in your possession you cannot give them the ball back and this was also this was the same problem and that was the reason why Detroit didn't end up beating the the Miami Heat because much like how Denver they allowed too much time left on the clock the Pistons allowed too much time left on the clock Cade Cunningham he shot a three and it ended up missing and then Bam comes down the other end and wins the game that is that is not very good time management, and that's not something that really should be practiced, especially going into the playoffs. Because when you're Denver, I don't really think there's there's not really a guard on the Denver's roster, like on the Nuggets roster, that's competent enough to be able to guard Kyrie or Luka consistently. And they ended up costing them, even though like Jokic tried his best to contest <laughs> kind of rhyme there but it was still I just think it was poor time management they should not have given they should not have allowed Kyrie or Luka to get the last shot they should have not let the Mavs um have an opportunity to take the shot because that's their focal point and that is their strong point their offense they don't really have that good of a defense well they their defense has gotten better but it's not really their strong suit so they were able to win the game on their terms. You need to sort of make it so that they don't win the game on their terms, especially going into the playoffs. Now, if we're going to talk about playoffs, the Mavericks are kind of in, they might be in the play-in. Like, they're, right now they're the seventh seed, and the, the difference between the seventh seed and, like, the fourth seed is, like, one game. 
So depending on how it goes and depending on like the rest of the season, we could see the Mavs either stay as the seventh seed or we could see them go all the way up to the fourth seed. So dependent on how the season progresses is dependent on how but then how the um the play in is going to work. But this is starting to sh- this might shape up to be one of the most probably one of the best play in series and like best play in matchups you'll ever come across because 7th seed you go you have the Mavericks, 8th seed you have the Suns and Kevin Durant. Ninth seed you have Golden State with Steph Curry and then in the 10th seed as usual you have LeBron James with the Los Angeles Lakers. And this really has the opportunity to be one of the best um play in tournaments out there because a lot of these players they have roots playing with each other. Steph Curry playing with Kevin Durant, Kevin Durant playing with Kyrie Irving, Kyrie Irving playing with LeBron James, and they're all going to be pinned up against each other. Like that is and that is one of the that rivalry that like and that um that series that they'll have against each other, which whoever goes up against each other, regardless of which team ends up going up against each other, it's still going to be a great matchup. Now, Paul Pierce actually like I just read this um on uh, Instagram like a few seconds ago because Paul Pierce actually had a quote um about um or he actually had some things to say about Kevin Durant and his legacy, and he says. I've been kind of disappointed in Katie's team success. He says, he says uh, why he isn't mentioned in the goat conversation. Like, um, if you guys remember at the beginning and like earlier in the season, Kevin Durant was constantly asking like, why am I not in the goat conversation? I should be considered to be in the goat conversation. And Paul Pierce says, if we put him at the same standard as we do Stefan LeBron, he just hasn't met those requirements. And this is probably the first time that he's been that he spoke the, that the truth has actually spoken the truth um, about any of these athletes currently in the NBA. And I think he's right. I mean, I really don't think Kevin Durant has proven himself whatsoever. I mean, sure, he can be the best player on the best team ever, but that team won 73 games, won a title both with him and without him, both before and after him. And since Kevin Durant joined Golden State, he hasn't done anything in the playoffs aside from disappoint and disappoint. And I would know. I am Brooklyn. I am a Brooklyn Nets fan. I would know how Kevin Durant's legacy is shaping up right now. And that failure in Brooklyn is a very, very big part of it because he had all the pieces. He had everything that he needed. He had anything that he needed in order to win, and he just couldn't win. And now a lot of people that like KD are going to defend him by saying, oh, but his foot was on the three-point line. Well, guess what? He had an opportunity the next year to, to keep, the team, the te- bleh, keep the team together, excuse me, um, but he didn't end up doing that. Like, he's not a leader. He's just He just plays basketball. I'm sorry I don't see him as a good enough leader to keep a team together, like how I see Steph, like how I see LeBron, like how I see Michael Jordan, like how I see Kobe, as all of those like great leaders on a team. Now, a lot of people might have different opinions on Kobe, but I think he was a great leader, especially like what he did with Team USA. Now, let's focus a little bit more about um, the Mavericks and their situation going into um, the playoffs and like with Kyrie Irving and Luka. Obviously, like, um, this team it would be a lot better if they had defense and something to fall back on. But looking at how this Mavs team is with Kyrie, are they really better with Kyrie Irving? Is Does Kyrie really make teams better? I really do not think so. Because when the Mavs had Brunson in the lineup, the Mavs were going the Mavs made it much farther and they made it to the Western Conference Finals with Brunson in the lineup as com- supposed to having Kyrie in the lineup. Now having Kyrie in the lineup, they missed the playoffs the last year and now they're in the play-in with a chance to um to lose um early in the play-in and not even make the playoffs. <clears throat> so, and given how this Mavs team sort of struggles 
on the defensive end, matching up against Phoenix could be a death sentence for them. Because Phoenix has a lot more lethal weapons that they can rely on compared to the Dallas Mavericks, whose lethal weapon is literally just Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving. Like, they are very heavy on the isolation. If, and in Phoenix, yes, they are heavy on the isolation. But there's a lot more players that could isolate and could take a lot of these difficult shots. There's only two of them that could do that in, um, on the Dallas Mavericks. And not having any defense sort of just cancels out their offense. And that's not something that the team can really afford to do, especially going into the playoffs. And it's really like it's really difficult to sort of like to sort of scale this team because on some instances they could be the best team in the league. And then in other instances they could be one of the worst teams in the league, depending on if Kyrie decides to play or not, or if they have a good game or not. Now one of the reasons why I actually think the Nuggets ended up losing this game was because Jokic didn't end up getting a triple-double. He ended the game with 16 points, 11 rebounds, and 7 assists. And um, obviously, since he didn't get a triple-double, they weren't going to win. It's something, it's a very common trend. Jokic's triple-doubles often lead to wins, and they often lead to great team success. And Jamal Murray, he also had a pretty good game, and in the game with 23 points, but they shot, he shot 7 of 20 from the field. Now, that's not really ideal, especially like when you sort of have to be efficient for, um, for this team and you're one of the more reliable shooters taking the game-winning shots. I mean, he ended, up coming, he ended up coming alive late in the fourth quarter to sort of give them the lead, but he did miss that game-winning shot, unfortunately for him. Um, no one else really shot like that particularly well. Jokic shot 6 for 16 from the field, so one of his less efficient outings. And do, does this have an impact for the MVP conversation? Because while well, Jokic was putting up uh, these bad, well, not really bad numbers, but sort of mediocre numbers for his standards, 16, 11, and 7, like I said earlier, Luka was putting up 37, 10, and 3 along with two steals. So I'm not would does this will this be used as an argument to put Luka over Jokic in the MVP conversation? It might, but will it be a good argument? No. I personally do not think that um Jokic is going to lose the award to Luka Doncic at the rate that this Mavs team is going. Now if the Mavs they somehow go from 7th seed all the way up to 3rd seed, then maybe I can see that happening. But as of right now, with how they're in with how the fact that they're in the play in and um they are the seventh seed, I don't really see um I don't really see Luka Doncic winning this award. I really do not see him and um winning this award at all. Even though he does have the numbers for it, he does have the numbers for it, I just don't see it. But with that we are out of time for this second segment. So now I'm going to go ahead into the third segment where I'm not going to do my usual NBA recap. I'm going to actually focus on the Los Angeles Lakers and everyone's favorite topic, LeBron. So, I will be right back after this short break. Um sorry for any of you guys on the audio. It's just you guys know I like LeBron. You guys know how I feel about LeBron. He's the greatest athlete ever. So, I'm going to quickly talk about that after this short break, and it's not going to be entirely LeBron, so don't worry, LeBron haters. You guys won't have to hear me talk about him completely, so I'll be right back after this short break. 